Hi everyone and welcome back to the Westpac Enterprising Podcast. Today's episode will focus on all things agri-tech and innovation within the agricultural and food sector. I'm your host, Alison McGonigal, and delighted to be joined by two individuals who are very knowledgeable in this field. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you all to Bernard Carlson, who is the Program Manager for the Tech Innovate and Ag Innovate programs at the National University of Ireland, Galway. He is also the Joseph L. Vaughan Professor of Humanities and the former Chair of the Department of Engineering and Society at the University of Virginia. Bernard studied history and physics as an undergraduate at Holy Cross College, earned his PhD in the history of, and sociology of science at the University of Pennsylvania, and did his postdoctoral work at the Harvard Business School. He has written widely on the innovation process as well as on the tech, role of technology in the rise and fall of civilizations. His most recent book, Tesla, Innovator of the Electrical Age, has been translated into 10 languages. Next, we have Kieran Supple, who I've had the pleasure of working with over the last few months. Kieran, who hails from Ross Common, co-founded his own agri-tech company called Reap Interactive around three years ago. In brief, Reap Interactive have developed an innovative product that automatically weighs animals in their natural environment without the need for any human intervention. Kieran, I'll ask you to further outline your business later on in this episode, as I know there's a lot more to that um, than what I've just said. So a very big welcome to you both, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So guys, before we get right into it, I'll provide a bit of context for those of our listeners who may not be too familiar with the the area and the sector. Agritech is the use of technology and technological innovation to improve the efficiency and output of agricultural processes. So essentially, it is the application of technology to improve all elements of the farming and growing processes. Farming faces numerous challenges, such as climate change, labour availability, global hunger, food scarcity, among other things, and these challenges are said to only get worse in the years to come. For example, by the year 2030, the world population is expected to reach 8.5 billion, and it was found that food availability will need to increase by at least 60% to meet the demand of the additional people on the planet. Therefore, agriculture must change and grow to meet the demands and needs of the future. I think everyone will agree that the, even those figures I've just outlined are quite alarming and it's really highlights just how important architect is and increasingly will be in the future, not just for farmers, but for the entire human race. Agritech can allow for tremendous progress in crop yields, farm productivity, plant and animal health, sustainability, waste reduction and scalability. So Bernard, you primarily come from an academic or research background in relation to this topic, while Kieran uh, brings to the table a more industry or business uh, viewpoint, which I think will enable a really, really interesting conversation today. So I'm looking forward to hearing both your insights. And on that note, uh, I'll pause. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Westpac Enterprising Podcast. Today's episode will focus on all things agri-tech and innovation within the agricultural and food sector. I'm your host, Alison McGonigal, and delighted to be joined by two individuals who are very knowledgeable in this field. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you all to Bernard Carlson, who is the Program Manager for the Tech Innovate and Ag Innovate programs at the National University of Ireland, Galway. He is also the Joseph L. Vaughan Professor of Humanities and the former Chair of the Department of Engineering and Society at the University of Virginia. Bernard studied history and physics as an undergraduate at Holy Cross College, earned his PhD in the history of, and sociology of science at the University of Pennsylvania, and did his postdoctoral work at the Harvard Business School. He has written widely on the innovation process as well as on the tech, role of technology in the rise and fall of civilizations. His most recent book, Tesla, Innovator of the Electrical Age, has been translated into 10 languages. Next, we have Kieran Supple, who I've had the pleasure of working with over the last few months. Kieran, who hails from Ross Common, co-founded his own agri-tech company called Reap Interactive around three years ago. In brief, Reap Interactive have developed an innovative product that automatically weighs animals in their natural environment 
without the need for any human intervention. Kieran, I'll ask you to further outline your business later on in this episode, as I know there's a lot more to that um, than what I've just said. So a very big welcome to you both, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So guys, before we get right into it, I'll provide a bit of context for those of our listeners who may not be too familiar with the, the area and the sector. So guys, agritech is the use of technology and technological innovation to improve the efficiency and output of agricultural processes. So essentially, it is the application of technology to improve all elements of the farming and growing processes. Farming faces numerous challenges, such as climate change, labour availability, global hunger, food scarcity, among other things, and these challenges are said to only get worse in the years to come. For example, by the year 2030, the world population is expected to reach 8.5 billion, and it was found that food availability will need to increase by at least 60% to meet the demand of the additional people on the planet. Therefore, agriculture must change and grow to meet the demands and needs of the future. I think everyone will agree that the, even those figures I've just outlined are quite alarming, and it's really highlights just how important agritech is and increasingly will be in the future, not just for farmers, but for the entire human race. Agritech can allow for tremendous progress in crop yields, farm productivity, plant and animal health, sustainability, waste reduction, and scalability. So Bernard, you primarily come from an academic or research background in relation to this topic, while Kieran uh, brings to the table a more industry or business uh, viewpoint, which I think will enable a really, really interesting conversation today. So I'm looking forward to hearing both your insights. And on that note, firstly, I'd ask you, Bernard, to give your view on the current situation of the agricultural sector in Ireland. So, Alison, I think it's always important to uh, start a discussion like we're going to have today of looking at the big picture. And I've, I've been looking at our Irish agriculture for the last three years. I joined uh, the National University of Ireland Galway in 2019, and I see some important differences between what was happening in the U.S. and what is happening in Ireland. And the major thing is in Ireland, there is a, a strong sense uh, that agriculture is central central to the society and to the economy. Um, there's a series of ongoing discussions. Farmers and politicians don't necessarily agree, but, but agriculture is front and center. Um, and I think most importantly for what we're going to talk about today, uh, there's a spirit of innovation, uh, it, large and small that's uh, shaping Irish agriculture and is important for us to be paying attention to. Definitely. I very much agree with you there, Bernard. And Kieran, I'll just pass it over to you. What are your thoughts on the current situation? Yeah, similar, um, Alison. It's interesting to see it uh, from Bernard's viewpoint, especially coming into Ireland and, and kind of having a fresh look at it and a fresh view of it. For myself, um, I will be biased, I guess, because of my background and, and where I am and, and what I do. But um, I, I have a very positive outlook for the sector as a whole. Like it is key to Ireland and uh, Ireland as a, an economy, but there will be there will be big challenges ahead. And you know you can't turn on a TV at the minute without hearing all about the climate change and the need for change within the agri sector to address uh, this issue. But I think you know farmers are they're a resilient bunch, and we're in a great position to adapt and produce very high quality sustainable food here in Ireland. And, you know, we we'll see a lot at farm, a lot of change at farm level over the years and months ahead. But I think in the long run, we have the ability to make farming more financially and environmentally sustainable if we embrace these changes that are coming downstream. So overall, I have a positive outlook with a lot of change coming down the road. Certainly, yeah, that's, that's brilliant. And you kind of alluded to there, Kieran, in terms of the challenges so, Bert, I'd like to ask you, do you also have a positive outlook on the future ahead or would you have some concerns over the development in the sector, you know, whether it be in, uh, there's a lot of talk around the decline in farming amongst younger generations, um, more and more obstacles, making it harder for farmers to make a viable income from it. So what, what's your thoughts on that? You know, I, I share with Kieran a, a vision that it's, it's generally positive. And I think we do have to pay attention. And as an educator, I'm always thinking about the next generation and how do we how do we attract the the, the absolute best talent that we can uh, from among among Irish youth into farming and agricultural activities. You know, going into the future. Here's a 
a concept that, that I often talk about with students, which is it's absolutely crucial for, for us to think about a triple bottom line. And by that, businesses have to be, or enterprises have to be economically viable, socially valuable, and they have to be environmentally beneficial. And the triple bottom line that we should be talking about in terms of of agriculture in Ireland is it's got to make a good income for family farms. Agriculture has got to produce uh, high quality, as Kieran pointed out, uh, food at reasonable prices and it's got to be environmentally beneficial. In other words, we've got to be looking at, at, at practices that are going to be safe for the environment, both on the short and on the long term, that is to say sustainable. So, Kieran, do you believe there's enough being done in terms of supports? This can include state supports within the sector. Yeah, um, I think uh, in Ireland, we're in a great country for farming in general. Like, uh, obviously, being part of the EU, uh, we're part of a much wider state support network. Without the current state supports, the majority of small to medium-sized farmers, which are critical to the sector, well, these farms just, you know, they wouldn't exist. However, we could have more tailored supports around technology and development and the, and around the R&D within the sector. Like R&D and technology, these are going to be the key drivers in making farming more financially and environmentally sustainable. And as a country, there's a massive opportunity to be at the forefront of this technology development, to lead out on it. And these additional supports in this area, there will be a massive help in accelerating this development. So there is an awful lot of state supports coming to us already, which are great. But I think just some more tailored packages around the R&D and around technology development to help us around this crisis we have around the environmental issues. I think that would be much, uh, much of a, of a great benefit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I totally agree with you. And Bernd, come back to yourself as well. I know you wrote a book uh, titled Technology in World History, and you've also filmed 36 lectures on understanding the inventions that changed the world for the great courses. So I'll pose this next question to you. How big of a role does technology have in accelerating the agricultural sector as a whole? And in the context of your studies, how will it change the landscape of agriculture going forward? So a lot of times we we think about technology as simply being computers and smartphones and information technology. And in fact, when we did the Technology and World History book, we came to a moment where the publisher said, oh, here's what the cover is going to look like. And uh, and all it had was was an open laptop. And I was like, no. There are so many different kinds of technology that have shaped the world. And this is especially true if you stop and think about agriculture. I mean, technology has played an enormous role. There is no agriculture unless you have technology, whether we're talking, we're talking about uh, the plow and the hoe and the wheelbarrow at the, at the very human personal level, or we're talking about large scale systems such as irrigation uh, in Egypt and Mesopotamia uh, at the beginning of civilization to mechanization in the 19th century or hybrid crops in the 20th century. I mean, technology has always been there as the means whereby humans are able to produce more and more food and sustain a not only a larger population, but a richer, more interesting culture, what we call civilization. And the stuff that's up next is what Karen's working on in terms of information technology. Um, but overall, I think the key change in terms of the technology that we need to be talking about, I'd be interested to hear what you think about this, Karen, is is this is we need to shift from a viewpoint of thinking about that we get more food by extensive strategies. That is to say, by using more and more land, by having you know allowing dairy herds to get bigger and bigger, by by using more and more fertilizer. Or do we need to go on a path where we are working intensively? That is to say, you know, we we make the best use in a sustainable way of the specific inputs that we're dealing with. And one of those inputs, which I hope we talk about more, is information. Certainly, certainly. And that leads me nicely into the next question, Bernard, that I was thinking of is in terms of all those technologies, and I know, Kieran, you work a lot with this in terms of your business, how important do you think that it is farmers utilize and adopt a more data-focused approach to their farming practices? Um, as Bernard said there, in order to be more efficient and also increase margins. So do you think that farmers, especially those that, you know, within Ireland that may be quite traditional, realise the potential advantages and benefits to them that come with this data-focused approach? 
okay, yeah, so like in everything we do, data is key. Like we can't get away from that. <laughs> if you take, if you step out of agriculture for a second and you look at any other sector, like they're just immersed in data. Uh, everything from once they come into the office in the morning and they go home in the evening, it's all data analytics and around the decisions they make. And in some areas of agriculture, it's no different at the minute, but there's no reason that can't be right across the board. Data is key to everything everything we do. And it, it'll be key to making all the differences and the changes, what Bernard spoke about there, in order to produce more food more efficiently. It's going to be the data and data-driven decisions that will help in that. If you look at, um, we mentioned earlier on in, in, in our conversation around the decline in farm num- in farmers and young farmers taking, taking up the mantle. But if you do look, if you flip that in its head and you do look at the young farmers that are coming on board at the minute, these are really sharp individuals. Like I've met some of the smartest young farmers that I've come across. Like they're really, they're, they're a different animal, if you excuse the pun, like they're well educated, they're tech savvy, they know their numbers, you know, they know what it takes to succeed. You know, they don't talk about uh, acres and quantities of land or anything like that. They talk about specifics around their industry, numbers that matter, numbers that matter to the industry, and they're all over them. Now, they are in, they are in decline, but the ones that are coming on stream are really good. Like, you know, they really know what they're about. There is the traditional farmers out there, and they do farm in a certain way. They consume data differently. Like, the older generation of farmers, you know, you won't see them on tablets, you won't see them on iPads. You know, but they consume their information in a different manner. They're always talking to their peers and they always know what's working and what's not working. So for me, I think the, the focus or the key should be to focus on the efficient farmers, as these are the group that they're, they're, con- they're consistently trying to improve. So the question is, is really, how do you make the most efficient farmers even more efficient? And for us to answer that question, it is it's to give them the data that they need to, to make better management decisions. That's what it comes down to for me. Very, very good viewpoint on that, Kieran. And for me, listening to yourself and what Bernard said previously, um, in terms of uh, looking at intensive rather than extensive, uh, for me, it, it comes back that you know work smarter, not harder, to a certain extent. So I'll pass that question as well over to you, Bernard, in terms of uh, what Kieran's just answered around the the data focused approach. How important is that? Well, I think, I think here, and you made a good point, which is we, in the 21st century, we're swimming in data, and data is, is the meat and potatoes. We, we live in a digital culture. Very basic level, it's ones and zeros, um, but it's also a whole range of, of numbers and statistics and, and patterns that we can see. And, and to some extent, what's happened in farming is, you're absolutely right, farming has become much more of something where you're, you're managing. And by managing, you, I mean simply you're orchestrating a wider range of resources, capital, land, livestock, the right crops to plant. And, and in doing all of that, you've got to be able to make sound decisions. And the key thing there is, is discovering which are the numbers, which are the trends that you've got to follow um, that will allow you to succeed with that. And you make a very good point here, and it's, it's, that's what young farmers or the next generation of farmers is really paying attention to. What are those key factors that you, you, you got to be thinking about? I mean, once upon a time, people didn't actually talk about you know, a return on investment. That is a term that got invented at the, in the early 20th century by managers in, in very particular industries. And, and so the same thing is happening today. What are the numbers and how can we collect them effectively to manage farms much more effectively? Yeah, certainly. And you alluded to there how the, the younger generation are very, very much uh, sharper and actually willing to get involved in smarter techniques and practices within the farming world. And just whenever we're on that point, Bernard, I'd like to ask you a little bit more in terms of how we actually harness that, you know, that crop, not as huge the pun again, of the younger generation and how we can actually enable them to make these smarter decisions. And, you know, the likes of education, I think, is always key to this. So just going back to, um, I know you're the, the program manager of the Ag Innovation Program at the National University of Ireland, Galway. So I'd just like you to uh, explain to our listeners a little bit further in terms of what that program is and what it involves. My whole life has been about 
thinking about the next generation. And, and for many years, I taught engineers at the University of Virginia. And now I have the pleasure of working with a variety of students from, you know, all sorts of different backgrounds, or, but related to agriculture. And whether I'm talking to engineers or I'm talking to the, the ag innovation students, I'm, I'm thinking about how do we not just have practitioners, but how do we have innovators? And what do I mean by an innovator? I mean, someone who's going to be an agent of change. But to be an agent of change, um, you know, in this day and age, is is not necessarily being immersed in the technology per se, as much as being immersed in the problems and the challenges that people have in their in their lives. And so, in the Ag Innovation Program, which is a one year program that leads leads to a, a Master's of Science, it's it's supported by uh, the Spring, by Springboard, which is co funded by the uh, Government of Ireland and the EU. We work with students, about 30 each year, um, and the students bring a whole range of interesting ideas to the program. So we have people thinking about information technology, beekeeping, uh, you know, uh, better swards for, uh, you know, for, for, for dairy cows, you name it. Um, but what we teach them is, 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 is to go out and pay attention to the stakeholders, all of the people that are going to be affected by that technology. So it could be the customer. It could be the end user. It could be the person buying a quart of milk at the store. It could also be the dairy farmer who's actually running the farm. It could be any number of stakeholders that are involved. It could be people um, you know, at the Department of Agriculture or Chargas. All of those folks. And we ask students to basically take their idea and road test it against the needs of all of those different stakeholders and to formulate a solution that that will will work for as many groups as possible. Takes us back to that notion of a triple bottom line. It's got to be economically viable. It's got to be socially valuable. It's got to be environmentally sustainable. And, and so we, we give the students the tools to do that kind of work and become, we hope, innovators. Brilliant, Bernard. Thank you. Um, in terms then of, you know, we discussed already how Ireland is the European home to some of the biggest and most innovative global players in technology. How do you feel that your programme actually supports these ag tech entrepreneurs? Um, and also, do you see a variety of different students come into you or do they have a specific farming background? Right. So, so one of the, one of the things that's really, uh, you know, unique about our program is a lot of times, you know, students that have an idea will go into an entrepreneurship program and entrepreneurship is great, but, but as one of my old colleagues um, at, at my former university would say, it's all about blocking and tackling. That is to say, how are you going to set up the business? How are you going to finance it? What's the, what are the regulatory hurdles that you have to overcome? And, and we, we make students aware of those things, but we're really focused on, on, you know, how do you make an idea into a viable enterprise? How do you think it through? How does it actually have a good market base? And those sorts of skills are needed in large and small players. Any sector, but particularly at the ag tech sector in Ireland, needs to have large players and small players. The large players are there to scale up the businesses and at what level you need to have a particular idea implemented. Some can be implemented at the corner shop level and other things are, are really truly global or multinational enterprises. So you need the big players, but you're complementing them and also to basically uh, kick their butts periodically, you need, you need a series of small players coming in with the new ideas because less their little hearts, the Glambias of the world are not going to invent something radically new and different. They're in the business of driving down costs, of reaching more customers. We want the big guys to do what the big guys are good at. But we also need to recognize that the little guys are absolutely important because they generate the new ideas. They have the things that come from the heart, come from their passion. And, and often those are the essential ingredients for a dynamic economy, having those fresh new ideas, but also the large players that can do it. And our students who come out of the Ag Innovate program go in both directions. Some of them go to pursue their own ideas to upgrade their family farms. Others go and, and work for the large, you know, work for large, large organizations. Brilliant. Yeah, it's nice to see that mixture, I suppose, of both. And as you alluded to there, in terms of the, the new innovative startups, I'd like Pass it over then to Kieran. We're delighted to have you on board and to have this perspective uh, come from yourself. So, Kieran, if you could just explain to our listeners a little bit more in depth than what I've previously done on Reap Interactive, that would be great. 
No problem. And uh, I could probably take up the whole show uh, with with uh, when I'm talking about the business, but I'll keep it short, not to hog the whole limelight. So, the, yeah, the, as you mentioned, Alison, the name of the company is Reap Interactive. Uh, it is two founders, myself and uh, the other co-founder, Declan Malloy from Mayo. Uh, we describe uh, the business as a data company, mainly. We provide the hardware and software that enables farmers to farm livestock more efficiently and therefore become more financially and environmentally sustainable. And we've done it by developing an innovative product. We've called the product Bovine Plus. And the product measures and monitors animals in their natural environment without the need for any human interaction. And we use machine learning algorithms to provide the farmer with the data that they need to make the best possible managing decisions on a daily basis. So one of the key measurement, uh, measurement metrics we went after with our innovation was the capture of daily live weight. As we felt, this was the missing piece of the jigsaw for livestock farmers. Um, so once we had this cracked, we trialled it uh, extensively and we went out and we trialled it on a number of key commercial farms. And we, we received some outstanding endorsements for the product. And we feel now that we're in a position to make a real impact in the sector with this product going forward. Brilliant, Kieran. And just for the benefit of our listeners as well, you mentioned there the individual um, monetization of each animal itself. Um, can you explain to our listeners just how that's done via the tag on each animal? Yes. And this uh, we, we had a number of criteria that we set out that, that we wanted the device to be able to achieve. Um, and one of them was uh, to be able to monitor animals on an individual basis. A lot of stuff on the market at the minute and a lot of the competitors they measure whole herd and they give herd average. We wanted to get away from that. If we want to get serious about efficiency, we have to look at animals on an individual basis because across any herd, the variations in any herd is massive. And if you look at a herd collectively, you're just missing out on the real efficiencies that can be gained. So what we built into the device is um, every time the animal uh, uses our device, it captures their EID tag in their ear. So we read every animal individually. We're also connected to the AIM database, so it pulls down a full herd history. So now when the animal is captured in our system, we know all about its breed, its age, its sex, its parents, its genomics. We know we, we have all that information. And now we can start adding on an individual basis the weight data for that animal. So now the data is starting to become very powerful because you're building a bigger picture for that data. For the farmer, they're able to see it on an individual animal basis. So now they're able to adjust their feed rations and their mixed rations. And they're able to see what animals, what breed and what types are performing better at what stages in their life cycle and on what feeds. And they're able to adjust that and make the maximum use out of it. And also what it is leading to is it's is, is leading farmers to be able to process their animals at exactly the right times. So you're not overdeveloping animals and you're not sending underdeveloped animals. And in some cases, animals that just aren't achieving their targets or aren't, we say, of a significant breed or efficiency, well, the best possible thing is to remove them from the herd as quickly as possible because they will never reach their target on time or efficiently. So our device allows the farmer to make them kind of quality decisions on a daily basis. So now he can get really, he can get down and dirty on managing his herd to the most efficient manner possible. Yeah, I think that's what's key, Kieran, is the fact that you guys drill down into the individual data on each animal itself. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and the other thing about it, Alison, as well, we, what we tried to do was we, we needed it to be the current weighing process is, is very labour intensive. So another one of our criteria was we wanted no human interaction. We wanted our device to be working while we were sleeping. And that was one of the key things for us. And um, we managed to do that, build that into the device. It's fully automatic, fully electronic. So while the farmer is having his or her breakfast in the morning, they can be looking at their phone and they can see exactly how they performed yesterday. Are they winning or are they losing? Yeah, and having come somewhat from a farming background myself, I know that quite often weighing methods include the traditional, oh, I can tell by the look of them scenario. So having dependable data like this is fantastic. So just speaking of farming backgrounds there, Kieran, how has your background influenced your decision to become an entrepreneur? Well, 
I grew up in a small family farm and I always loved it. And then because it was a small family farm and we've talked about this, it was never going to be financially sustainable for me to work full time on it. So I knew I had to go off and get an off farm career. So after finishing school, I went to uh, Letter Kenny IT and I got a degree in computer science. And I followed that on a number of years later with an MBA from NUIG. And then myself and Declan, we were always looking at ways to improve farming and looking to see how we could apply our IT knowledge to the sector. And when it came to farming, I suppose we always had a bee in our bonnet about not consistently knowing on a day-to-day basis if we were winning or losing. Basically, were the animals that we were breeding, were they actually putting on weight for us or were they not? So we felt without this information, we were flying blind. And both myself and Declan worked full time in the IT sector and we were fairly well up in our jobs. And like we spoke about earlier, we continually immersed ourselves in all the data in that sector. But yet when we came back to do our farming, we were there was the unpredictability about it, saying, well, like, how did this week go? How did yesterday go? How did last week go? And how are the weeks ahead going to go for us on the farm? So we were trying to take that unpredictability out of it. So what I'd say is, is that probably farming in itself um, really didn't in- influence me in becoming an entrepreneur, but the sectoral knowledge mixed with the IT and business background, it made us well placed to embrace the challenge. I suppose that's probably the best way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, well placed. I think it's a very good point. And I know it's actually quite uh, good that you've made that point, Kieran, that I suppose it's not necessary for someone to have a farming background to get into agri-tech. And so that's a shift back across to yourself, just in terms of that, you know, whether it be, as you mentioned, or you previously were involved in the engineering discipline, how do you see in terms of attracting students across all disciplines, whether it be engineering, uh, business, and so on, how would you attract those uh, kind of people to get into the agri-tech or get involved in the Ag Innovate program? So I think, um, you know, you don't need a farming background to to get involved in the Ag Innovate program. In fact, I think one of our strengths as a program is that we attract students from all sorts of different backgrounds. It's a program for adult learners, uh, so they often not only have had time at the university, but they've had anywhere from three to five years of experience out there. Um, And we have farmers, we have uh, people from uh, food and hospitality, we have uh, people that just are deeply concerned about the the big challenges that we talked about at the top of the hour, climate change, food security, um, general, the general well-being of the, of the population. And, uh, and bringing all those people together is, is a great opportunity because those that aren't farmers pretty quickly learn in those conversations uh, during the, during the tea breaks, uh, what they need to know about, about farming. And in terms of the future, it's, it's absolutely essential that we, we don't, we don't segment and sort of say, oh, well, only the farmers work about, worry about farming and only the doctors really worry about health and only engineers really worry about the, the critical, whether it be the information infrastructure that Kieran worked on or the physical infrastructure that we're all so dependent on. We all have to be responsible for these, these various areas and we all have to welcome a variety of people coming in to, to not just ask why, but more importantly, ask why not. For sure. And Kieran, just as well, for the likes of someone who may come through, for example, the Ag Innovate program or um, someone who's just a budding entrepreneur, um, you might benefit from hearing your experience in terms of what support you received during the startup process and also what issues or problems did you experience during that stage? Well, <clears throat> I'm listening here and I, I probably should have done Bernard's program before I even set out on my journey, I might have saved myself a lot of time. But um, yeah, in, in in general, like we had many challenges along the way as we expected this, I guess. Um, what was probably an advantage to us, uh, Bernard, at the early stage was, is myself and Declan had a sector of knowledge. So it allowed us to, I suppose, hit the ground a little bit quicker. We, we knew the problem we were going after at an early stage and it was that problem we we're trying to fix so but that's not notwithstanding every day brought up new challenges but what i did find was how helpful people were when you reached out to them when you used your network and this was something that actually shocked us we have a linkedin network we have a facebook profile and twitter and we've all these networks and we're connected around the globe and we never actually reach out to them 
And when you're starting up, it is for me, it was one of the key learnings for me was when you actually reach out to your network or your alumni and you might not have spoke to them in years. They might be a friend of a friend of a friend that you're linked in with and they'll put you in touch with somebody like I can't emphasize how good it was in getting us started. And how helpful people were. People that didn't know myself or Declan for Adam, but when we explained what we were doing and what we were about, offered help and offered support. Like I have one example. We trialed our product to death on our local farms here to make sure that we knew what we were about and the product worked. And we had to take the leap then to go for what we call the commercial trial. We had to do a number of high profile commercial trials to make sure that it was working for the industry. And we identified some key players that we wanted to try the product with. And I remember our first person, we identified them and we're saying, well, how are we going to get in contact with them? And we just went on and we started seeing who was connected with them. And he eventually got a phone call with them. And he says, come up and have a cup of tea with them. And we had a cup of tea. And we were slightly embarrassed at this stage because we, all we had was an MPV product to try. And we were a bit concerned about the look and the feel of it. So, you know, we were approaching this very successful uh, beef finisher and we we're going to in this product. Well, he took us in with both arms like he was so helpful. And we found that along the journey, everybody that we approached, they, they will offer their support, they will offer their help. They like to see people getting out there and trying to make a difference in the sector. And as it happened, what, the, what our innovation uh, brought to the table for that beef finisher was a problem that he's been trying to solve and has spent tens of thousands of euro on products trying to solve it. And he was delighted to see that there's a new way of thinking about solving this problem. And he, he gave us a massive endorsement for the product with the data we're able to generate off it. So that'll be one of the key things I would suggest is, is reach out to your network. Like they're going to be absolutely key for you. I guess the other one then would be around funding. We had a long development period because we were actually physically developing a tech product. We had a long period. And when you think a month is going to develop something, I would say double that because you had always have hold ups. And then we had this whole tech um, getting our hands on chips and everything, this whole global problem and shipping problem during COVID. So we had a long, we had a long development period. So we had to try and maximize the funding that was available to it. And we had to make the funding that we got, we had to make it work very hard for us. So you can't really rely on one source of funding because some will be good and they'll come through for you. But for every five applications you put in, you might get one or you might get none. So it's a relentless process and you just have to keep going at it and take the knockbacks on the ones you don't get and 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 be glad for the ones you do get. And then there was uh, great supports out there for, for our companies. The likes of yourselves, Alison in Westpick was a, a great support. We were on the NDRC program. We were on numerous uh, Accelerate programs. And then I have to say, like, our local Erskam and Leo, like, they've just been a massive support. We contacted them early days and they got in behind us and just all on our journey, massive support. We're also on the New Frontiers program, and that was really a game changer for us. Um, for anybody starting up in Ireland, I would certainly recommend you look into it as well. Um, it's, it's, it's just a phenomenal program, exceptionally well ran, and, as I say, a game changer. And Enterprise Ireland as well, like, they're a massive support body there for us. You know, they were a huge support along the way and we're currently on a journey with them now as well to become part of their HPSU network, which ultimately it'll be great for us. Mm -hmm. For sure. And Kieran, I think there your first point around networking is one quite often that I find time and time again, our clients um, are quite shocked to see how willing people are to get involved, to help. So I think, you know, not just within this sector, but across the board, um, that, that very much is the, the thought on that. Um, yeah. I've mentioned before in a podcast that a saying I quite like is, your net work is your net worth. And I think that rings true, you know, in terms of time and time again, each client uh, will back that statement up. You're particularly right around the fundraising as well. There's so many key supports and Thankfully, you, you naturally kind of, I suppose, gave a good list there of what's available in Ireland. And I think that will help anyone who's listening today in terms of where's their first port of call in terms of if they have an idea and consequently, who do they reach out to? So thanks yeah. for that input, um, Kieran. And one last thing I'll ask is before we, we get to wrapping it up is, Kieran, in terms of your story, it's phenomenal, the progress you've made. But what now are the ambitions for the next three years? We're two quite ambitious individuals and we went about setting this business up to make a difference and to make a change. So we have big ambitions. 
And we want to take our product global and we want to make a real contribution to the sector and the environment as a whole. And doing this by decreasing greenhouse gas emissions on a global scale while allowing farmers to remain efficient and therefore produce top quality sustainable food to feed a growing population. That's ultimately in, it's a big ambition, but we feel we can play a big part of it. Brilliant, Kieran, and it's great to see that. Guys, I'll finish the last uh, question with uh, asking both of you this. What advice would you give to someone working in the agricultural sector or anyone for that matter who identifies a gap in the market but doesn't know where to start? So, Barrett, I'll start with yourself. What advice would I give to people who see a gap in the market, whether they be a farmer or they be in another sector, is to pursue any opportunity. Kieran is absolutely right. You need to recognize that it's going to take a village to come up with an innovation. If you don't have it already, you're going to need to create a network. And that network is is incredibly important. As again, Kieran's story indicated, you need to talk to people both, you know, sort of up the line in the value chain and down the line in the value chain, but also in terms of both the technology and also the market. And and in many ways I've come to the come to take the view that understanding the market, what what's really bothering people and you know, and finding out who can really help you make sense of that problem is is absolutely crucial. And Kieran's story about finding just the right person to basically do the big test on, you know, that be finisher is is crucial. And in some ways that almost takes the advice I'd say is pay attention more to that because a lot of times the better you understand what those end users are going to need, the easier it is to develop the technology. And in fact, that's the question I throw back to Kieran is, is this, do you agree with that? Is, is this, as you better understand the end users, what the customer is going to need, what the application is, that often helps narrow the, the, the challenges in terms of actually coming up with the technological solution. But Kieran, you're, you're the IT man here. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Like, you can go off on a tangent very quick. You have to make, for, for me, you have to make sure that this is a burning problem for enough people. Like myself and the co-founder, it was a burning problem for us on our own farms, but that was never going to be good enough. This had to be a burning problem across the industry, and we knew that. So we had to get out there and do some very quick and dirty, high-level analysis uh, in the market. And I mean, that was as basic as picking up the phone to people we knew that were large-scale farmers, that were efficient farmers, that were new entrants, a mix of all the a mix of all the people that we will eventually be trying to sell the product to, and find out of them: is this actually a problem for you? And if it is a problem, is it a big enough problem that you want to get solved, or is it a problem you just talk about and don't really want to get solved? Once we had enough evidence of that, we knew then that well, we could continue on the journey because it was really from that point on that it was you know that we had enough evidence that it was going to be success. So for anybody, I suppose, setting up or, you know, that are trying to identify a gap, it may be a gap for you or maybe a small bunch of people, but I would say it has to be a gap for the large majority of people in the sector. You know, you have to go after them bigger problems or else you'll be developing something that might be hard to sell or hard to get out there in the market. So it is a long journey. The other side, it says you have to surround yourself with positive people. If you're a solo founder, I would be a strong advocate for getting a co-founder on board with you because it can be an extremely lonely journey. You spend an awful lot of time in your own head and it is great to have a co-founder there that's on the same page as you that you can bounce the ideas off and you say, look, are we right in thinking this way or are we right in thinking a different way, you know? So I think that is, you know, that's kind of, for me, they'd be some of the key criteria. And also surrounding yourself with positive people like, um, there's enough people out there that will continually knock whatever you're trying to do and you will get challenges on any given day. It's a roller coaster of some great positive news in the morning and some negative news for a couple of hours and you have to ride that journey out and there's always going to be enough people to knock what you're trying to do and that'll never work and this won't work and that won't work and all this. You have to surround yourself with some key positive people that you take counsel of people that you really respect their opinion. And if they're behind you and on them bad days when you're thinking, is this actually a problem or not? Or is this going to work or not? It is them people when you pick up the phone to them and they, they will make sure that, you know, keep you on the journey and that, you know, you're doing the right thing. You just got to persevere with it. So be some of the key things that I found on my journey so far. 
brilliant, Kieran, and I think your first point there around market validation is absolutely crucial. Um, it's something we see time and time again at Westpac, and we strongly encourage our clients to nail that first um, in terms of, I think it's key to the success of the, the business. And lastly, I think it's a very nice way to, I suppose, end the conversation around um, surrounding yourself with positive people. I think the underlying uh, word you have there is don't give up. Um, I know it's a roller coaster for a lot of startups and founders, but I think what shines through there from what you've just said, Kieran, is the don't give up uh, attitude is key. So guys, just to wrap up our session and as our listeners who listened before will know, we do a little quick fire round of questions. Before we get into that, Bernard, just give a little bit of details and round the Ag Innovate program. And if there's anybody that's interested, how do they sign up and when is the closing date? We are uh, currently taking applications for um, the program. It's a blended program with students coming to Galway uh, once a month. Uh, they come from all over Ireland on a Saturday. And then on Thursdays, we beam out uh, lectures and do group activities um, throughout the throughout the year. Uh, so we will start in September. So our application deadline right now is the 15th of August. Um, so, uh, you know, tell your family, tell your friends. Um, and uh, the way they apply is that they go to the Springboard um, website uh, that's 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 available. Just put uh, tap in, uh, you know, Springboard and Ag Innovation to uh, your search engine, whether it be Google or Bing, and that'll that will come up. Uh, if they have specific questions, they should reach out to me. That's uh, what it means to be the program manager. Is as I try to sort out the uh, the different issues that they may have uh, about not only the content of the course, but do they have um, the right qualifications? Do they have the right sort of idea uh, that they might want to pursue? But um, are are taking applications right now and would welcome uh, people from all over the West and all over the country. Brilliant, Bernard, and we'll include your contact details in. Thank you of this episode for anyone listening that's interested and Kieran, how does anyone go about contacting Reap Interactive? Yeah well we're in the process of finalizing our website and um, getting that market ready at the minute um, but anybody can contact me on my email address that's kieran.supel at reapinteractive.com and um, I can address uh, it'd be great to hear from anybody that's interested in the sector or anything to add in the area that we're working in or any thoughts about the area we're working in. Brilliant guys and all contact information will be included as I say in the the bio for this episode. So as I said we'll finish off with the quick fire round. So work from home or office? Home. And a mix of both for me. Brilliant. So Apple or Windows? Oh Apple. 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 Mm -hmm. No Windows man for me. (laughs) Email or phone calls? Phone calls, but even better, uh, walking around and talking to people. I would be the exact same. Brilliant. I like that. Tea or coffee? Coffee. I'm an American. Tea all day long. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Um, Hard copy or soft copy? Hard copy, and uh, I'm happiest editing student papers uh, when I've got, you know, I've got my fountain pen in hand, and it's a double-spaced document. Hard copy for me. Microsoft Teams or Zoom? I think anything from Microsoft is probably a virus on my computer, so I'm a Zoom guy. (laughs) And I'm a Teams guy. (laughs) So LinkedIn or Twitter? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Early bird or night owl? I'm now an early bird, but uh, I've had many, many long nights. <laughs> and, yes, I would be an early bird. Brilliant. Reading or podcasts? Reading. Reading. Brilliant. Time blocking or winging it? I am a wing it kind of guy. Yeah, I think wing it as well. <laughs> it may be the nature of entrepreneurship and innovation. Exactly. Exactly. And guys, last one. More or less than eight hours sleep? More than eight hours of sleep. Because I am, uh, we, we have a running joke that um, I am the crown prince of the bed. <laughs> and Karen? Any day you can get more than eight hours sleep is a good day. Take I, it. I was going to say that as an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, thank you very much. And that concludes our episode today. Thank you all for listening in and talk to you next time. Bye.
much, Addison. Thank you, Allison.